All right, thank you for the introduction. Um, as you said, I'm Cody, and uh, I'm an adjunct at SDSU, which, which means they kind of like me and I kind of like them, but the, <laughs> they, they don't actually pay me. It's the Dakota Lakes Research Farm that pays me. How are we doing with the microphone? Do we need to? I'm just going to shut this one off. Where are we? Yeah, don't come too close. It might get ugly. <laughs> We okay now? Yeah, so. A little better? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Do I need to move I'll find some this around maybe? You go ahead and keep going and I'll do this. Or maybe get this out of here. <clears throat> maybe it'll work a little better outside. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, I, I consult at the Dakota Lakes Research Farm I have for the past several years now, and it's been a, a fantastic experience for me. I, I wanted to start things today just by recognizing my grandfather who uh, passed away this past year. He, when he was 14 years old, his dad uh, gave him the choice of buying some cows and raising cows, or he could go to high school. And he chose to, to stay on the ranch and raise cattle. And because of his hard work throughout his life and his generosity, uh, his kids and his grandkids like myself didn't have to make that choice between the cattle and, and going to college. And so I just wanna, wanted to say thank you, Grandpa. And you know he's one of the many reasons why I'm able to stand here today with, with the education and with the background on the ranch that I've got. <clears throat> uh, the Impossible Burger. You guys probably have heard of this. It's a, it's a veggie, it's, it's one of the latest veggie burgers, right? And it, when you look at the picture, the, the Whopper on the left and the Impossible Burger on the right, uh, they don't look a whole lot different, you know, when they're presented this way. And I'm not here to talk about whether it's a good idea or it's a bad idea or, or <laughs> good things or bad things about it. Uh, my interest in it is something else, and, and it's the question of, why will people buy it and what does that mean for people who might be raising livestock or raising beef in particular? And number one on this list I've got up there is to save the earth. If you look at the website uh, from the, the company that produces the burger, uh, they're very straightforward about saying that's why they're doing this because they believe their product is better for the earth. They're saving the earth if we're eating the impossible burger rather than uh, animal products in our burger. <coughs> And like I said, I'm, I'm not going to go into what those claims and whether they're, they're correct or they're not correct. I wanted to focus a little more on the other two points. The number two I've got there is taste, and then I've got the price. Um, you know, research has shown that people who grow up eating grass-fed beef prefer it to grain-fed and vice versa. You grow up with one thing, you tend to like it better. And it's in my head, I wonder if, you know, people who grew up eating veggie burgers might actually prefer that to, the, to a regular beef burger. In any case, there are a lot of people who do eat it. There are people who like it. And so it's, it's out there. People are eating it. People are going to enjoy it, right? And finally, not, not, not that everyone will, but some certainly will. And then finally, price. Uh, if I understand right, right now the price is probably a little bit higher than your regular burger. But this is, a, this is made in a lab. It's an industrial process. And I assume that they will get better at it. This is a pretty new product, right? Chances are they're going to get better at simulating the flavor of beef and the, the eating experience of beef, and they'll probably get, be able to do it cheaper too. And so what happens if they do get the price point down to being the same as a beef burger or, or less, and they get the taste to be pretty close? What happens then? What are people going to eat? Well, I, I suspect we'll see a lot, of, a lot of people choosing the burger, right? And it might not be one or the other. It might eat some of one and some some beef and some of the, the veggie burger. And right now, keep in mind, less than 2% of the, our population in the states now, they say, is involved, directly involved in agriculture. So most people, most people who are eating don't have a real clear understanding of where their food's coming from. And the main choice that they've got is, is something kind of like this. You know, most of the beef is coming through our conventional methods, which includes a feedlot. And then we've got, a, you know, the impossible burger on the lab on the other side. And when people are presented with this choice, some will choose one, some will choose the other, right? That's, that's the way it's going to be. But those don't have to be the only two choices. 
And that's what I'm suggesting is another way that we may produce some of our beef. And I think when consumers are presented with this choice, that we'll get some more people choosing to, to eat beef. And I'm, I want to put out there the idea of this art, artisanal beef. And I've got under there wine, coffee, tea, and chocolate. Those are products that, where this idea is already, is, is already out there. And I, in the back near the coffee, there's a little table set up. There's a bottle of wine and a box of tea back there. I encourage you to go back there, read the labels on those products. Because when you read those labels, you, you find out all kinds of information about how they were produced what the soil was like, and maybe what the weather was like, what the guy's name was, who ran the vineyard, um, what this product is going to taste like, and so you get all this information before you even, you know, open the bottle or the package. And I wrote, there's some pieces of paper there too, I wrote up some examples of what that might look like for beef in central South Dakota. And, and I just, uh, the, the idea, the main idea is this sentence I've got here down at the bottom, Tell people how we care for the land and the animals. Because if we're doing a good job of it, caring for the land and the animals, we want to communicate that message to other people. And chances are we can be rewarded for it in the marketplace. And I think we can get a better price for the products that we're, that we're producing. Because there are a lot of people in this world who are buying food who care about how it was produced and they care about how we, how we took care of things. And I think that along with this, there's the opportunity to develop some terroir uh, for South Dakota beef. This is a, a fancy word. Usually you see it with, uh, in relation to wine. And it, the idea is that the particular environment where those grapes were grown impacts the quality or, and the taste, the particular flavor of the wine. And right now we think of beef mostly as a, a commodity where it's all the same. But I think there's a lot of opportunity to develop particular, you know, tastes or flavors or terroirs of beef and market it that way. <clears throat> so today I'm going to, I'm kind of going to talk about several different ideas and I'm hoping that in th at the end they'll all come together and it'll make sense why, why I jump around a little bit and it, it we'll have this constellation that comes together. That was the marketing part, okay? Now, integrating livestock with crops. Why in the world would we do that? Because uh, as you guys know, having livestock around is a lot of extra work. They can be a real pain in the butt, especially if you're trying to calve, you know, during the middle of a snowstorm. And so why would we do that? Well, some of the reasons on the left, the, I've got some of your standard crops. On the right, I've got some forage and perennial crops. If you, want, if you integrate livestock into your operation, it gives you a lot of, it gives you some bi opportunities for biological and economic diversity. So you could, these forage crops I've got on the right, you could grow those even if you don't have livestock. But the livestock, if you grow them and you have livestock, now you've got an opportunity to harvest them and make some money at it at the same time. So if you believe that you need more diversity in your rotations, if you want to put more, you know, you want to grow a cover crop after the wheat that you had that after you harvest your wheat, and you want to make some money on it at the same time and not just put all of it back into the soil, that's where the livestock come in and you can, you can make some money on it. And because if you're, if you're just growing these for, for hay and you cut the hay and you sell it to your neighbor or to wherever, you're exporting, you just lost the benefit that you had, most of the benefit you had from, from growing that crop because you didn't keep the nutrients and the biomass, the organic matter, right there on your farm. So you get the opportunity for diversity, and a couple of these things here I have down at the bottom, alfalfa and switchgrass, those are both perennials. You have the opportunity now to put some perennials in the rotation and make good use of them. Why would we want to do that? Well. This is an amazing picture. This is a big blue stem plant. You can see there's just a little bit of green up on top and look at that massive root system below it. <clears throat> this is why we'd like to have perennials uh, in our rotation for those massive root systems. That's one of the big reasons anyway. And in, in full disclosure, these, these plants were grown in special containers you know, that allowed them to get nice deep roots and then they can harvest them and wash the roots out and make a nice picture. So, uh, there is that, but they, they didn't just go out into the field and dig them up. But, you know, these perennial grasses, like these, these warm season native perennial grasses, like big blue stem switchgrass, 
they can have roots that go well beyond six feet under the right conditions. And so, you know, compare that to our, our annual crops, which have much shallower root systems typically, but even if they do get their roots way down deep, like a, say a corn plant, it, that corn plant's starting over every year. So those roots, even if they do reach a pretty good depth, there's very little of the growing season that they actually get down to that depth, whereas the perennial has those roots down there all the time once they get established. So what are some of the advantages of these deep roots? Well, nutrients going up. So those deep roots are extracting nutrients from lower down in the so soil profile, nutrients that your annual crop can't get to, and <coughs> they, they draw those nutrients back up, incorporate them into their bodies. So, so now, after that perennial's been there, we, your annual crops are gonna be able to access some of those nutrients that have been brought back to the, near the nearer the soil surface, uh, wine being one of those examples. Another reason to, to have those deep roots is bringing the water table down. That's something that people are probably more interested in now than they were five years ago. Uh, with you know, those deep roots, they're, they're gonna be able to access some, a lot of that water that your annual crops can't get to. <clears throat> so now going, transitioning a little bit from the ideas to what we're actually doing at Dakota Lakes, native tall grass plantings, and we can point to an example of, of where some of this idea came from. Uh, in Argentina, there used to be a traditional practice of having seven years of crop, you know, annual crop, followed by seven years of a pasture. And so these pastures typically would be a grass legume mixture. And, and so they go back and forth. And that's one way they would maintain some of the fertility of the soil. At Dakota Lakes, we're trying something uh, a bit similar, except we've got 15 years of crop followed by five years of perennial pasture. Now we just started this, and so I can't say that these are the magic numbers, that it's 15 and five, right? But we believe that this is gonna really benefit the soils that we have in this rotation. During those 15 years of cropping, we still have a crop rotation where, so as you can see here, we're gonna go from winter wheat to corn or sorghum and a cool season broadleaf. So we do that for 15 years, and then we transition into the perennial. Now, this is, uh, so this is a picture of our, our switchgrass. So the perennial that we've used so far, this first time around has been switchgrass. It's, for the most part, it's a monoculture of switchgrass. Half of it, half of the field we designated for seed production this year and harvested seed off of it. The other half uh, we grazed, and we've grazed that uh, for two or three years now. You can see the cattle out here in July. Uh, the advantage by grazing, of course, is that the nutrients are going back to the soil and the organic matter. <clears throat> Now one of the challenges with putting that perennial in and only having five years of, of, uh, of having that perennial in, and remember our, our objective of putting it there is to benefit our soil. Now when you, you start a perennial like a switchgrass or something, that first year a lot of times they only get about yay big. Even if you've got you know, good conditions and you get a good stand, you might not get much growth. Second year they're getting bigger but they're still not at say maximum capacity. So there's establishment year down, second year we're doing okay, but now we've got two years gone by and we haven't done anything for our soil yet. In fact, because of the low productivity in the first year, I wouldn't even be surprised if we returned less biomass than usual. So that just leaves us with three years out of this five year of the perennial to try to, to really do a lot of good stuff for the soil. And we're choosing, we chose switchgrass, it's, it's a high biomass crop, and it also has a high carbon to nitrogen ratio. So idea there being that we're gonna put a lot of carbon back into the soil to build up that soil organic matter, but we only got three years to do it, so something Dwayne and I have, have talked about and we, we've tried out is try to accelerate that, uh, that establishment process a little bit by planting the switchgrass in a year when we still have a grain crop there. So what we did uh, last year was we, we planted uh, two rows of wheat and then a row of switchgrass. Two rows of wheat and a row of switchgrass. Uh, we also tried putting the wheat and the switchgrass together in the drill and planting them all at once. 
And then the other thing we did, uh, we planted the wheat and then we came back later and planted the switchgrass over top after the weed had already come up. And that last treatment, it appears that we, we did damage our wheat yields with that. Uh, all three treatments, I, I went out there and counted switchgrass plants, which was rather tricky <laughs> because they're they pretty little. But uh, uh, it looks to me like we probably got a pretty good amount of switchgrass out there in all of those cases. Um, not to say that you might not have to come back and reseed some, but uh, this, this coming, well, this growing year now, uh, when things start greening up again, I'll be going back out and checking on winter kill on that to see if the switchgrass uh, survived. Because it, you know, it didn't get very big, especially being there under that wheat canopy. <clears throat> this is a picture of a mixture of switchgrass and big blue stem. This is on some heavy clay soils. And pretty shallow soils, heavy clay. And this picture was actually taken in 2018, which was wet in a lot of parts of South Dakota, but at Dakota Lakes, it was extremely dry. And it was just amazed me how much productivity we got out of these native warm season grasses, even in a, a droughty year like that. And this picture was taken in July, uh, end of July, and it's, it's headed out here. And so was, in terms of quality, I mean, you can see the cattle are here grazing. Um, this is not great quality at this point. It would be better to graze it earlier in the year. But, you know, also depending on your objectives, if your objectives is to return a lot of biomass to the soil, it can still meet that objective even if the, the quality is low. <clears throat> and so right next to that, we had some degraded rangeland. And I say degraded, um, you know, it didn't include these warm season grasses. There were some native grasses, some exotic grasses. And I just went out there and I uh, took some samples to check on the productivity. 3,600 pounds of productivity at the, uh, on the native range and about double that where we had planted the switchgrass and the big blue stem. Just amazing what they could do. Now, in terms of quality from an animal nutrition perspective, uh, the, the, neither one of these is very good but the, uh, the switchgrass and big blue stem was, was very poor quality. But a key factor here is this is taken on July 26th. So we wouldn't expect it to be very good that time of year. <clears throat> Another thing I like to do on the farm, we've got along, around a lot of the, f the field margins, we have switchgrass planted. And so, you know, we've got the field over here, switchgrass over here. And in this particular case, we've got smooth brome growing back here. You can see it's, it's brown and it's headed out. The date here is July 8th of uh, this past year. And I'll, I'll go a lot of times to these areas on the farm and try to make a, a fence line comparison, you know, side by side. Because uh, smooth brome, you know, that's something we have in a lot of our pastures. And if you've got cattle, you know, you know, it's really good forage early in the year. Cattle love it. It's high quality. But what happens as you get in, you know, towards the end of June, into July, it, you know, it gets mature. Same thing with crested wheatgrass, you know, they're great early in the year, but we don't have enough cows to graze all that lush green grass we have early in the year. We get into summer and then it's not much good anymore. Um, so on this date, on July 8th, when I took these samples, well, either side of the fence, the switchgrass was three and a half percent higher in crude protein than the, the smooth brome was. So that's, that's a big advantage. Now, typically you would think smooth brome is a better quality, but again, it all has to do with the date because at this time, the, the smooth brome was already mature this, and the switchgrass is kind of just getting going in, in June and here in early July, it's still high quality. So we've got some good, good quality for the cattle to graze that time of year. I made a similar comparison for the past several years. I've made a similar comparison in the ditches by Dakota Lakes, uh, switchgrass and big blue stem on one side, smooth brome on the other side. Uh, this year, I actually didn't find very much difference in quality. Again, this was in early July, but in, in past years, I usually find in early July, the switchgrass and, and big blue stem are a little better than the smooth brome. <clears throat> but in all of these years, I find, I will find that the we're getting more productivity out of the big blue stem and switchgrass than the smooth brome. And that's, you know, in early July, that's the case, but they're not done growing. If, if I waited until later, uh, there'd be an even bigger gap in terms of productivity. We're getting more productivity from those tall grasses rather than smooth brome. 
<sighs> okay, so now transitioning, those are some more of the planted stuff. Now transitioning to a, a pasture situation, uh, three years ago, Dakota Lakes rented the pasture that's right across the road from the farm. And this pasture had been uh, continuously grazed for a long time and mostly dominated by exotic cool season grasses like crested wheatgrass and smooth brome. Uh, some, we have some cheat grass and some Kentucky bluegrass out there too. And so we wanted to transition it from that into more of a, a, more of a native dominated uh, pasture. So, so specifically looking at putting things in like the big blue stem. And so in order to do that, we were trying a lot of different strategies. So we set up an experiment where we, we sprayed out with glyphosate so going north-south, we'd sprayed with glyphosate or atrazine or both or no spray at all. And in this picture, you can, pro you can make it out, I think, that you know, there's a brown strip here and a green strip here, brown strip. You know, so you can tell where those strips are. So we sprayed out and then, and, and I don't, I don't, I don't want to advocate spraying going out and just killing everything in native rangeland. That's, I, I have to give that disclaimer because this, I, as, as a rangeland guy, I, I definitely don't want to suggest that. This is a case where we pretty much had exotic species and I think a lot of this land where we did it may have been go back land. It was probably farmed at one time. So mostly there wasn't a whole lot of native that was, that was left there to spray. But, so we've got the spray treatments going north-south and then we seeded going east-west. So what we end up with is a big checkerboard of treatments. We did a mixture of grasses, mostly big blue stem, and then we did that also with some forbs or some broad leaves, and then we did areas where we didn't seed anything. And after, and those first two years were just bone dry at Dakota Lake, 17 and 18, and we saw very little results from that. But this past year we finally got to see uh, some of those grasses coming that we had planted. And what it looks like now is that, you know, after three years, we're, the, the story's not over, but so far what I can tell you is that where we sprayed glyphosate and where we drilled, we had fairly good success at getting some new grasses established there. But if we only drilled or if we only sprayed, it, neither one of those treatments really worked. <clears throat> And we did do one other thing, one other change in management besides the spraying and the seeding, uh, and that's the grazing. So rather than the continuous season long grazing, we've been moving, moving the cows in this particular pasture, sometimes more than once a day, in other cases, you know, maybe a day or two. And we don't do that all year long, we don't do that all the time, but with this, this rapid grazing, even that was not enough to, you know, to bring those species back on their own over three years. So there's kind of a lot of caveats there. <clears throat> I don't want to say it can never happen, but I think that this, this particular land where we were working, we didn't really have big blue stem there to begin with. To, I don't know that if we even had a seed bank left to, to, for it to come back on its own. Uh, and one exception to the rule of r having to spray and drill both is that we, there were some areas in the swales, you know, so some wet areas, if you follow along these, where the, the, the low places in the, in the landscape where it's wet, some big blue stem that we planted did come up there, even without herbicide in those spots. And what's circled there, you probably can't really make it out very well, but that is a big blue stem plant that's not very big. <laughs> you know, it's only about this big. And there's a lot of that out in this pasture. And so I think that over the next year or two, we're going to see a lot more. But chances are, you know, if, if we continue to get a little bit of rain, chances are this is project is going to look more and more successful as time goes on. Three years really isn't enough to judge it. And this picture is in here just to basically show that there's a lot of diversity out there in this pasture, which uh, as an ecologist, that's something we always like, diversity. <clears throat> Okay, similar issue, but a little bit different site now. Uh, Dakota Lakes just this past year got a lease on the land between the farm and the river. And so this is, it was the core land now. The Game Fish and Parks has it. 
And there's a little spot there that's just beautiful. It's full of Indian grass, which is one of our native warm season grasses, and Maximilian sunflower, you can see them here. But this is the real exception to the rule. Most of this land is just like that pasture, dominated by the exotic grasses that we wish we didn't have so much of. And I, I loved this picture because it, I took it on October 3rd and most of the landscape is brown and, and uh, you know, there's no flowers to be seen, but this Maximilian sunflower, if you're interested in you know, wildlife and pollinators, where else are you gonna find uh, flowers like this uh, in October? So one of the things we're doing there, we're trying to get those grasses back and we're doing the rapid grazing thing again. And what we do, we're focusing our grazing early in the year, in the spring, because these are those cool season grasses, we're trying to hurt them, right, and tip the scales in favor of the warm season grasses that we planted. So we grazed this several times really early in the year. And the other thing we did is we broadcast some seed out there and then we just, just did that. We also broadcast seed and rolled some bales out over top. And then we also drilled some spots. And so, you know, this is what it looks like in May or af right after we've rolled the bale out there. Uh, here is, is in July. There's still a lot of it visible. And, and it, even into September, a lot of that bale is still visible. Um, in some places, it was on pretty thick. And so to this point, we don't have Many of those species that we planted, have, not many of them have come up. I, you know, I looked around and I did find a few plants. I might even have a picture, yeah. I'm holding one there, you can't really tell. but <laughs> There are a few out there, but I sus I'm hoping that a lot of those seeds are still viable and as the bale breaks down, maybe we'll get more of it out there. And those bales, we used bales of mature switchgrass and big blue stem, so there was a lot of seed in them as well. Okay, now I'm gonna transition to, uh, fr from all, all those perennials to the, live, the, the cropping side of things. Uh, but being an ecologist, uh, even when I transition to the cropping side of things, I start you out with a slide with bison and uh, grass on it. All right, because, because if I'm gonna talk about a cropping system and trying to, to design it for wherever your farm happens to be, I think the, first, the place you need to start is think about how Mother Nature did things there and learn lessons from her, right? And so, you know, this is a picture that could be taken in a lot of places in South Dakota. We've got grass and bison, and so you've got a, a diversity of plant species in this picture. You've got some of them that are green, some are brown, so some are actively growing, some are not. We've got an herbivore eating it. Um, this, this, and we could imagine that there are they're not in the picture, but the antelope are just over the hill and the rabbits are hiding in the grass. And the, you know, we've got all, lots of different, we've got lots of diversity, both plants and animals. And <clears throat> this is what built up our, our soils, right? This is what gave our soils fertility. And if we think about the flows of nutrients here, there wasn't, there was hardly any export, right? Because the animals eat stuff and they're, they're not shipping it uh, across the ocean to another country. They're not, we're not taking stuff very far away. Um, and that's a, that's a real key factor. And if we dive into a little bit of the details of that, if we talk about nitrogen, for instance, there's a lot of nitrogen in the atmosphere and it gets into the soil, plants can take it up. This is a picture of a lead plant, which is a legumes like an alfalfa or a pea or a soybean, you know, it's gonna, along with the bacteria, it's going to fix nitrogen. When that nitrogen, or when that plant is consumed by the animal, in fact, very little of that nitrogen stays in the animal. Almost all of it is going to leave the animal in feces and urine and go back to the soil. And if we look at what those actual percentages are, we've got the, the retained nitrogen and this is on pounds per acre here. So it's only about a pound or two per acre retained. And this, you know, to, to, do, to put numbers to this sort of thing, you have to make some assumptions. So I said 10, head, 10 acres per head for six months. And th what's the nitrogen that's retained? Well, if you have a growing animal, nitrogen is, is a key component of muscle, right? So that's where most of that nitrogen is gonna end up. So if you've got a, you know, a stalker calf or something out there that's growing, that's, that, the nitrogen is going to that. If you've got a mature cow, her, she's not really changing much in weight, so she's not 
keeping a lot of the nitrogen, but if she's got a calf at her side and that calf is growing, that cat, when, that, when you sell that calf, you're taking nitrogen away, right? Um, but it's not very much. It's not very much nitrogen relative to what they ate. Most of what they, the nitrogen they eat stays in your field or pasture in the form of urine and feces. All right, now suppose you put that calf into a feedlot instead. Well, if we, again, we have to make some assumptions. So what I said here is, well, suppose you had a 500-pound calf and you fed him to gain at a rate of 2.1 pounds per day. Now that's a pretty low gain for a feedlot, but, but let's just, so, so basically what I'm giving you is a kind of a baseline scenario, kind of a best case scenario. If you want to feed that calf and you have no waste, so again, that's not realistic, right? It's going to take 56 pounds of nitrogen. So you're going to take 56 pounds of nitrogen off of your field and bring it over here to the feedlot to feed the calf. And that's best case scenario. At the same time, that, that, and when I say you're taking it off, you know, you're taking it off in the, the hay or the grain or whatever you're feeding that calf. That's how much nitrogen you need if you don't waste anything. Um, you're also taking off a lot of phosphorus. And the nitrogen you can get back from the atmosphere. The phosphorus, you're not getting it back from the atmosphere. It's gone once you take it away. And, and then you're taking off a lot of organic matter too. Now in contrast, if you look over here, if you, these are what the numbers look like if rather than taking it from the field and giving it to the calf in the feedlot, what if you took the calf and you put him over here in the field so everything he eats, all the manure and urine and everything is going back onto the land. Well, when he's, after six months that calf has grown and that's why you're still taking away some of the nitrogen and some of the phosphorus and some of the organic matter, but uh, you're keeping a lot more on your land. And if we take a look, if we just subtract these numbers like 56 minus 9 and 6 minus 2, I've got that on this next slide. What's the difference? Well, 47 pounds of nitrogen, if it costs 30 cents a pound, you know, that's worth $14. How much is the phosphorus worth? $340. And this is elemental phosphorus, not P205. So, You've got $17.50, roughly, worth of nutrients just in nitrogen and phosphorus, and then organic matter. Uh, I know it's very valuable, but I didn't put a number there because I know whatever price I put in for it was going to be wrong. So I don't want us to forget about the value of the organic matter. <clears throat> so with that in mind, then that, to me that presents the challenge of that I've got stated up here, how long can we keep our animals and the nutrients that they eat on the land? So to, to me, that's, that's the question, that's the challenge that we have to look at. So specifically, what are we doing at Dakota Lakes? This is something that we're, we're just beginning to try. These are electronic feeding stalls, and they're actually designed to be used in a dairy. If we flip around and look at them from the back, this is the end that the cow would come in. So she walks in there, this green deal reads an electronic ID that she's got on her, hanging from her neck, and it says, oh, this is, you know, cow number 326, and today she's going to get a ration of, it's a pound of corn, and then a pound of peas, and a half a pound of soybean meal. And it, it's, so it's tailored specifically to this animal. So if I've got a 1,600-pound cow out there, and I've got an 1,100-pound cow out there, they're, they can get different amounts of supplement based on their needs. Same thing if I'm trying to fatten calves out on, on field and, and pasture, and I've got a, you know, a 600-pound calf and a 900-pound calf with different nutrient requirements, they can get different levels of supplement. And the way we've got three, right up here, there's uh, one, two, three of these little black things with the yellow sticker on them, that's, that's where the feed comes down. So we can actually provide three different kinds of supplement in any combination that we want, any mixture that we want. <clears throat> and we envision that these things will move around field and pasture with the cows. And that's where this comes in. Uh, Dwayne and Jim, Jim's our uh, fabricator. Jim's, they, they've been working on designs. Jim has mounted this solar panel on top of an irrigator. And so we envision that this will also have shade on it. It'll pull those feeders around. We, we may have the water pulling, getting pulled around with it. 
Uh, we eventually, maybe we can build other things on like scales and uh, fly control, things like this. And if we can, because if we can move this around the pasture, we can get better grazing distribution. Right? And we can get, we can have that urine and the manure spread out all over the pasture, all over the field, rather than having it all end up in the, you know, the one spot where you set the feeders, right? So with any, with any luck, we'll have this operating sometime this summer. <clears throat> now, what have we been doing? Uh, I'm just going to kind of run through a, a year in the life of the cattle at Dakota Lakes here. Where, what kind of, what are they eating at different times of the year and what the, what's the quality there? Early in the year, we start on those exotic cool season pastures, the crested wheatgrass and the smooth brome. They're very, very good that time of year. Then we, in, as we get into June and July, we tend to, we transition more to our tall grass, our native tall grass species like the switchgrass. And this one, in this particular picture, you can see we actually interseeded some uh, peas and it was a kind of basically a cover crop mixture into the switchgrass. They didn't actually graze this until early July, but uh, I can tell you they, they really enjoyed being out there with the combination of the the tall grasses and those cover crops. It was a good diet. In this picture, when, when we are grazing the tall grasses, we, we prefer to move the fence pretty frequently. And you can definitely tell in this picture where the fence was yesterday, right? <laughs> right there. And at this point, it's uh, July 30th. The quality of this is quite low. The crude protein is getting to be down pretty marginal even for a dry cow. And so it may require, this time of year, it may require some crude protein supplementation. <clears throat> Another thing we did in the middle of the summer was on the, the pivot corners, we had some cover crop swaths and we grazed those. And being that it was in the middle of the summer, you can see dates down here going from late July to late August. Uh, it was hot and it was humid and those are great conditions for breaking down organic matter, right? So I was wondering what was going to happen to the quality of these swaths over the summer and that's why I took samples at several different times and you can see that for crude protein, you know, we lost a couple percent points of crude protein and TDN, that's the energy content, stands for total digestible nutrients. So that's the, the energy or the calories, you know, it's what you need to put pounds onto on an animal and we can see, you can see we lost some quality there too, just over the course of a month. <clears throat> As we get into, we, we calve in August and September. And on this particular field, this is a, a dry land field, not irrigated, and we got two forage crops off of it. And so the first forage crop was, we baled up and set aside. And in fact, before we baled it, we, while the swaths were on the ground, we went through and we drilled the, the next crop, which was the German millet, which you can see here in the foreground. And so then, when we were ready to graze it with our cows that are calving, we started putting the bales back out onto the, the field. And so they've got a, a mixture of, you know, they can graze the bales and they've also got some of the German millet. Now, we move the fence every day for this too, so we kind of ration it out little by little. And it worked very well this year with rain. Now, this is a picture taken from the same spot last year <laughs> when it was very dry. It, did not, it didn't work quite as well. We got the first crop, we got the bales, but we didn't have enough moisture to get that second forage crop. The, the idea was the same. In fact, I think, I think the previous two years it did not work very well. This year it worked excellent. <clears throat> so back to this year or, or to 2019, uh, this is the same field from the other direction. You can see, you know, all the manure that we're leaving behind here, just what we wanted to do. They also had access at the same time to some standing corn to graze. And as you can see, we, that was, uh, we fed a lot of soil. <laughs> we fed the cows with it, but we fed the soil quite a lot too. A lot of it gets trampled. But they had, I think they had just gotten into this area, so they would be able to clean that up a little bit better. I mean, the cows would eat a little bit more of it that's on the ground there. Uh, and the other thing is that they, we gave them some switchgrass. There's a, all, so at the same time, they had access to all three of these different crops. And the switchgrass at this time of year, it's not that good a quality. And so it's providing, it's more of a bedding sort of, probably. But it was interesting to me to see that they still ate some of it. 
And it is, just goes to show that, I mean, it, we all like some diversity in our diet. Even chocolate cake, if you ate it for every meal every day, you get tired of it eventually. And cattle are no different. You know, they like to have some diversity in their diet. Uh, moving into September now, we grazed a standing cover crop, and the quality on this was just fabulous. You know, 26% crude protein and 64% uh, digestible nutrients. <clears throat> okay, now, uh, we're, as we're getting close to the winter, uh, one of the questions we've been asking the last couple years is about uh, fertilizing or not fertilizing our cover crops. And this is a picture from uh, 2018. And in, I and put this in here because you can really see the difference between the you know, fertilized and not fertilized. You can see these strips out there. Um, however, it, when I actually went out and took, collected the samples, I couldn't find very much difference in, in yield between the fertilized and the non-fertilized strips. You know, sometimes our eyes can be, be deceiving. But another thing, but there, I mean, there's definitely some impact there. Right? I mean, you can see it. You can see that there's some impact. But it was not as dramatic as you might think. And in fact, the statistics said that there really wasn't a difference in how much grew. But another thing we noticed is that where we fertilized, we see this, we got green up again. So the, fertilize, the strips that had been fertilized after we swathed, they, they, they grew and greened up. And where we had not fertilized, they did not. But that didn't really add a whole lot of uh, biomass to the equation in terms of forage or soil health. So we did it again this year. And this year, uh, in, besides going out there by hand and, and cutting stuff and weighing it and all that, I also used a drone to take images. And we got you know the regular uh, visible light images. We also used uh, some near-infrared uh, cameras and calculated uh, uh, NDVI, which is supposed to tell us how much is out there. And so I, I did both the drone and the hand sampling. And on this particular field, which is not irrigated, you can see the yields that we've got here. 3,000 pounds per acre fertilized, 2,400 pounds per acre not fertilized. But whether I collected my data with the drone or by hand, the statistics say there's no difference there. That is hard for me to believe. And I'll, I'll get a little bit more into that in a minute. But the other thing we see is that the fertilized part had a little higher crude protein. And so that's also beneficial, but again, the statistics didn't, uh, didn't support me there in saying that there's really a difference. But statistics aside, we got a 25% increase here going from not fertilized to fertilized. And if we calculate just on the non-fertilized part, it cost us $62 per ton. If we assume that we had to hire someone to go out there and do all the field operations and, that, and bought the seed and everything, $62 per ton uh, using custom rates. And then if we, if we consider that we put on 45 pounds of nitrogen and the extra forage we got for that, the use of fertilizer, it cost us $59 per ton for those, that extra tonnage. So neither one of these is bad, a bad price for the quality of this forage. We did the same thing on one of our irrigated fields. It did get irrigated one time, uh, three quarters of an inch is all. And on this field, the yields are very similar, 3,100 pounds to 2,200 pounds, very similar to the other field, to the field that was not irrigated. Uh, this time, though, the statistics support the difference. And they say, yeah, yeah, there really is a difference. You know, the fertilizer really did something. And we see it in the crude protein also. And so cost per ton for the non-fertilized is similar, you know, $68 per ton to produce the non-fertilized. But then with the addition of fertilizer, it cost us $40 per ton, the cost of that fertilizer, to produce some extra forage. So again, good prices for this high quality forage. <clears throat> so what we do with it then, this is follow following wheat. We've planted this cover crop, and we're planning to graze it over the winter. And we swath almost all of it. And we have the cows eat the swaths. Uh, Duane also left some standing strips this year so we can make a comparison between the swaths and the strips but mostly it's just the swaths. You can see 11 days later, this picture I took now, a lot of the green has faded out of that, out of that standing crop. And a lot of you are probably familiar with this, but with the way we prefer to move the fences over the winter is with the irrigator, so we don't have to be moving posts all along. 
You can see the, the white wires. Those are our, our hot wires there. They're hanging from the irrigator, and so you go out there and you press the button on the irrigator and it moves your fence forward 20 feet or whatever. So we've got the swaths running one direction and the fence running perpendicular to it like this, and we just move that fence along the line. So the cows get an extra 20 feet or, or whatever the number is. You know, every day we just give them a little bit more, ration it out to them. If you've taken a tour at Dakota Lakes, you've probably been on top of our calf shelter. Um, on the back side, you can't see in this picture, but the back side of it, there's a, a, a piece that we can flap down and then it, it covers up the back side. The calves can get in there. <clears throat> here you can see the, the fence is back here in this picture. And this undisturbed snow right here, the cows haven't been there yet. You can see yesterday, this is the area they were working in. And so here's a swath. You can see this swath in the foreground that they were eating and they haven't bothered the snow near as much in between and then here's another swath. So the cows, are, they do uh, a fine job of finding it and if you think about um, the, the sw grazing the swath versus grazing the standing, if you've got a 20 foot swather, you take all that 20 feet and you condense it down into two feet, right? And now if there's no snow that doesn't make a whole lot of difference. But once it starts to snow and cover that up, now the cow only has to search these two feet where the swath is, right? And so the kind of the action she does, she, she reaches down in there and she kind of takes a bite and, at the, and then she, as she picks her head up, she kind of flips some of the snow to the side. And she reaches down, she picks it, takes a bite and she kind of flips some. And so it's almost like she's tunneling along where that swath is, moving the snow to the side. And because we're moving this fence every day, she can see where that swath was yesterday and she knows where to look for it tomorrow. Now you get a bunch of new snow or if it, it crusts over on top, sometimes you might have to come through and help them out a little and maybe drive over top and they can see where it is or they, so they can kind of get in there, get that first bite in there and start working at it. Um, but they don't, they don't come at it from above, they come at it you know, from the, the side horizontally and they work through it that direction. The cat, you know, the calves even get out there and do it because we're fall calving, so we've got the calves out there eating swaths too. So I did the same thing here as I did during the summer with those swaths. I went out every month and I collected quality samples to see what's happening. And of course, during the winter we expect it to be preserved better than during the summer. So with those cold temperatures, we expect the quality to be maintained versus the, the hot, humid summer. And, and that's pretty much what we see. Uh, we, we lost a couple percentage points, just like in the summer, but it took three months to lose it rather than one month. And the difference between the, you know, one of these is standing, one is swath. Well, you know, there's a little bit of difference here, but there's a lot of variability in the data. Not, a, not much difference between them in qu terms of quality. The difference, I think, is mostly in the cow's ability to get to it. I also measured the TDN. Again, remember, this is the energy or the calories that's in it. And we see a decline over these several months. But, and this is one field, I, I collected the data on another field too. And if we look at this second field, the, the loss of crude protein isn't much at all. Same with the, the energy, not a whole lot of loss of energy. So we can see that we do lose some quality in these swaths over the winter, but it's not real dramatic. And it's better than the summer. So besides giving the swaths every day, we also give them some, uh, some corn residue every day. And the, the, the swaths are high quality, and if that's all the cows got, it would be a great diet. The corn residue is not as good a quality, and, but it provides some fill, and they do find some, some ears in there that the combine missed. And so you put those two together, the diet's not as good as what we'd like the cows to have over winter. And so we also give them a little bit of supplement which could be in the form of uh, flaxseed meal, soybean meal that we produce on the farm. Uh, could also be, uh, it, you know, it could be corn or peas or uh, lentil, sorghum. <clears throat> uh, this is another drone image that I took, and this is on a, a corn field. You can see this spot up here where we had some really wet soils this year, and all this, this part of the field is on the right uh, that got planted later because it was wet. 
And so from the drone imagery, you can definitely see those differences. And this is, this is supposed to be telling us where we had more corn or less corn, right? I also have uh, cages out there w w that we don't let the cows into. Because, and I do this on a lot of the fields where we let the cows graze to find out what kind of impact they're having. And so I thought, and, and I go out there and I harvest with, uh, I, I do some hand harvesting or some small plot combines to harvest those and try to compare yields to say, well, if we had a cow out here last year, you know, is, is it hurting our corn yield? Is it hurting our soybean yield? And so far I haven't been able to find any differences. So this year I enlisted a drone to help me out and the drone couldn't find the differences either. So, so I'm, uh, <laughs> I have not been able to find evidence of the grazing hurting our yields at Dakota Lakes. And I, so, so how do I explain that? I know some, there are, are some people who have said that they have had trouble. And I, I don't have a, a scientific study where I set this up to make the comparison yet, but I suspect that what's happening is it's the particular way that we're managing things at Dakota Lakes. You know, these soils have been in long-term no-till for decades. And the way we graze those cover crops is first we have a, a wheat crop and we harvest it with a stripper head. And this is a picture of what the soil looks like. You know, we have, I mean, look at that. I mean, it's just completely covered with the straw from, from the wheat. And then we've, we've got our cover crop in here and the cover crop gets, uh, gets swathed and, and concentrated in one spot, but that ground is still covered with the wheat straw. So when our cows are out there, they're stepping on that armor. The wheat straw is the armor. And the other thing is we're moving these fences every day, right? And so they're never staying in one spot for a long time. And if we do get really soft soils, you know, with some, some moisture and the soils are not frozen, we'll tend to move the cows off of that field and put them into a, a perennial grass area for a while and feed them some bales. But even if they're, you know, if everything doesn't always work out perfectly. It's a, you know, Dakota Lakes, it's a real, it's a, even though we do a lot of research there, we have these challenges everyone does. And sometimes the cows are on the field when it's, the soil's a little bit soft, you know, and you can see some hoof prints. But even then, we're moving that fence every day. So they're not camped out in one spot, beating that soil to death for a month at a time. And I, so that's what I, that's the speculation as to why we're having the success we are. So that is the end of my presentation, and, but I just wanted to post this question up here again at the end. Uh, the challenge that I see is how long can we keep our animals and the nutrients they eat on our land? And I hope that the, uh, all those stars form the constellation, the marketing part, and the, the read the, the beef label in the back, you know, how that, if we can get a higher, if we can get a premium for doing the good things we do for the land and keeping the cattle on the land and the nutrients on the land and the organic matter on the land, uh, hopefully we can, we can bring that all together. So I should have time for a few questions at least. If there are any. Any questions? <laughs> I got one back here. Yes, sir. Uh, on the question was on the Shields pasture when we did the grazing, how many head were out there? Uh, we have 30 cows, and so, you know, from year to year, plus or minus 30 cows, and the, the whole, that whole pasture is around 80 acres, but uh, that part where we're doing the experiment, we, tent, we have them in uh, paddocks that are less than an acre, like the smaller, some of the small paddocks are about uh, two-tenths of an acre. And then the larger ones are about four times that, I think. So just, just under an acre. So 30 cows in, in that area. So it's not, it's not as intensive as, as some of the really high stocking rate mob grazing, uh, but it is much more intensive than uh, typically what you would see. Any more questions? Okay, thank you very much, Cody. All right, thank you.